today thank you for coming spring is almost here you, you notice my fig tree outside <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> these little leaves I have, I have it in the basement so I just tried to get it to get a little bit of sunshine so we had a, a nice uh, questions at the end of the session <laughs> That's fine. We were trying to record. Yeah, and I'm recording, so you know your voice is just going worldwide right now. Oh. It's Australia, <laughs> in Canada, in Greece, even. You know, so. I'll be quiet. No, no, no. I'll be quiet. No, you you're free to express yourself. You know, we, we have free will, and we will say what what do we want to say here? Okay, we will not be restricted. We don't have thought police. They're trying to have in some nations and uh, in perhaps in our future. But, uh, we had a fruitful trip in Chicago with uh, some, some friends, Yogi and Sotiri, and also uh, Stan Koskinas, and uh, we spoke about the theology and the works of St. Gregory Palamas, whom uh, we celebrated last Sunday, and he was the greatest theologian of the second millennium, along with Photios and uh, St. Mark of Ephesus. But I believe the, uh, the theology of St. Gregory is central to orthodoxy because the purpose of our life is theosis, to become godlike. It's not about works. And this is the big difference between Western theology, Western thought, where you are saved by works because you really cannot come in contact with God because to the Westerners, God is unknowable, unparticipable, then you can never really know God. So you can just know about God and salvation to them is a reward. God gives you a reward in the other life for the good things that you do here. Salvation is totally different in orthodoxy. Where we become united with Christ, we become united with the energies of God. So right from the beginning, St. Gregory teaches that after the fall, the energies of men were distorted. Adam was focused on God, his desire, his love, everything, his whole being was centered on God. But after he was deluded and deceived by the devil, then that connection between God and Adam and the environment was broken. That chain that connected everything together, which is called the grace of God, it was cut, and now Adam does his own thing. Eve wants to do her own thing, and then the environment wants to do its own thing. Now the environment rebels against Adam. That balance is broken and now the microbes, diseases, and death attacks Adam and all his future generations, all of us. So death, disease, all affliction came in the world after the fall. So St. Gregory teaches us that the purpose of our life is to return to paradise, to regain what was lost by the fall, to be able to see God in this life. And he teaches that we cannot connect with the essence of God, and this is the kind of information that the Western Church lost. They lost the distinction between the energy of God and the essence of God. And I will simplify it. We have the sun in the sky. Nobody can go to the sun. It will melt in a second. I mean, it's five, five million degrees. So we cannot come in contact. We cannot commune with the essence of the sun. But we enjoy the sunshine. We enjoy the warmth. We commune with the energies of that ball in the sky called sun. Okay. Again, this is not an exact example because there's no such example because God is uncreated and these are created words that we are 
trying to we're trying to articulate some things but we will never know exactly who God is and but we know by revelation we know from the scriptures and we know from our saints the experience of the saints that teach us that through purification of the heart we can actually see feel taste God from this life and this is what our saints have taught us and they have experienced. So remember, the devil always tried to destroy the work of God, destroyed Adam because he was jealous that after he lost his place in heaven and now people have the ability to become God-like, he's extremely jealous and he always is going to try to destroy God's creation. And this is happening in our days. What do you think is happening today? The very same thing that happened in the garden. The devil told Adam, why are you listening to God? You can, you can become God. You can have all this knowledge. I can teach you the knowledge. You don't need to have God on your, on your back. You can do your own thing. Go ahead, eat from that fruit. And then God, who respects people's free will, allowed Adam to be on his own. Of course, Adam repented outside of the garden. But now this is repeated through the centuries. The devil will also instruct and inspire <clears throat> his agents, to try to do away with God and become gods themselves. You remember when we went to the moon, like some 60, 70 years ago, the, the newspapers in Greece, we don't need God now. We don't need God. We, you know, we're going to go to the space. We have, our technology is going to take over. We don't need God. You see the, the pride, the pride of a man who always wants to become God, to become his own idol. And this is exactly what's happening today. Someone, I think Mary, Mary sent me an article, I think you saw it, Valerie, about some of the technocrats who want to eventually, Harari and Schwab and all, all these globalists, the demons agents, that's who they are, what they want to do is they want to infiltrate the human brain and connect the human brain with AI, artificial intelligence, and then they will be able to detect any kind of bad genes, anything else, and they'll make men live to two, three, four hundred years old. What is this? These are the demons all over again teaching men that you can become God without God through artificial intelligence, through robots. We don't need God. This is the initial lie of the devil and it's going to be repeated and eventually the Antichrist will enslave the entire world because the elitist Midases are doing a pretty good job not because they have anything new to offer but because we have left God. Europe has left God. And as we said in past talks, if you believe in nothing, they will get you to believe anything and everything. And that's what happened to the university kids. They come in your class believing nothing. So anything they feed them, they'll grab it because they have nothing to compare with. They have no standard. And certainly they don't know how to give any kind of opposition. A, a student in Canada, I saw, I don't know if you saw that, a university student said, listen, the Bible says God created a man and a woman. And this is what I believe. They threw that kid out of the university. They it's threw a him. School. A oh, Christian okay. school? Yeah, that was a Christian school. That was, that was a, a Christian school. Yeah. Wow. Be aware of Christian schools. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I have a question. Western Christian schools. I, I'm, I'm amazed. That was a Christian school. Yes. It was expelled until the end of the year. Oh, that's incredible. Wow. And then I saw some but other, some other deacon. Of an apology, I understand. Didn't I they? didn't see that. Yeah. Some other deacon in England who took on the Church of England. I forget his name now, but he's really a great speaker. And he, he was spot on about the homosexual agenda. And the Church of England said, no, what was it, Kevin, being a non-Orthodox? I mean, you don't have to be Orthodox to know these things. No, you don't. I mean, even animals know the difference between a male and a female. I mean, it, it, this is incredible. Yeah. We are worse than animals today. So, you, 64 you know, genders. 64 yeah, genders. So yeah. this... Don't forget, he's in the half. This person who, who's, who's basically, uh, he, he knows the scriptures well. What did you say, George? Yeah. 64 and a half. <laughs> well, I had another question. 
other one up. The first, the Adam, first, the first woman. Uh, no, sir, I'm serious. She, she came. She came without sexual reproduction. She came from the rib of Adam. I, to okay. Okay. But the whole thing is how did how did we forget it? <laughs> uh, that's a different topic. <laughs> That's Genesis. That's Genesis. We'll have a discussion. Yeah, we'll have a discussion. That's Genesis. Okay. And, done. Uh, that's a done deal. Tomorrow night. Yeah, right. Okay. We need, to, uh, we need to continue. And these elitists, they are having their way because the majority of humanity has really abandoned their God. So because they believe in nothing now, they believe everything, but God is going to have, I know you get these videos and some of them are very depressing. I got one from Greece last night and I wasn't feeling well. I saw part of it and it just kind of, I was deflated a little bit and I said, you know what, I'm gonna turn that off. When you see a video that's bringing you down a little bit, just turn it yeah. off because we cannot lose our joy because of this. No. We have to continue to have our joy. Being in repentance, being hopeful, it's having our joy. Without joy, we lose the Holy Spirit. Right. Okay. So up. joy yeah. is very, I mean, if you see somebody who's isolated, a person who's depressed and really isolates themselves, they're in trouble because the evil one, it has taken all the joy away from them. That, we cannot allow that to happen. We know the end of the picture. We know the end of the book. The lamb will overcome. Christ will overcome. Christ will be the victor. So we have this on the second psalm where when you see all these things happening, just go to the second psalm and you will see what will happen to all these nations, the kings of the earth plot in vain. They are plotting in vain. They plot against the Lord and against his anointed, against his church, the remnant of his church. And he who sits in heaven shall laugh at all their stupidity. He will hold them in derision. Oh, you thought you could be gods. You thought that God doesn't exist. So the globalists and the Hararis and the shrubs and their satanic agents will be crushed eventually. This is what the book of the Revelation says. So again, in our days, the devil is mimicking the theology of St. Gregory Palamas. St. Gregory says in our church, it's not just St. Gregory's theology, it's the theology of the church that was that needed to be articulated all over again on the 14th century by St. Gregory. He says, yes, we can have communion with the light of God. God is light. And if, if we purify our heart, then we can see God. It's in the scriptures. This is exactly what St. Gregory used against his opponent, Barlam. Barlam said, nobody has seen God. That's true, but that's half a truth. No one can see God and live. That's true. But God said to Moses, go behind that cliff and you will see my back. What is the back of God? The energies of God. The energies of God. The incarnation. You cannot see the essence of God because God is consuming fire. You'll become, you'll become fried. But you can see the energies of God. You, know, you can feel the providence of God. You can feel the compassion, the philanthropy of God. All these things are available to us because the energies of God are infinite. Mm. On Mount Tabor, Christ only took the three because the rest of the apostles were not ready. Their eyes were not ready. They were not ready. And he didn't want to exclude Judas because if Judas would go up there, he'd be fried. <laughs> okay. Remember what happened to St. Paul when he tried to, to, to uh, go and apprehend Christians on the way to Damascus. What happened to him when he was hit by the uncreated light of God? He fell off the horse and was blinded. Yeah, you say so. Yeah, but after after the resurrection, the eyes, the Holy Spirit came into the world, and then the eyes of the apostles were open, and they all had all our saints have this spiritual experience, which is seen the light of God after we do what? Blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. That's it. Mm -hmm. So if we purify our heart, we will see God from this life. So that's what the gospel of the cross is. Tomorrow, third Sunday of Great Lent, the gospel will begin. You can see how wise the church fathers will pick the proper gospel reading 
for every Sunday to expand on that theme. So tomorrow, the church will elevate the Holy Cross to give us strength because the cross is the power of love to show us how much Christ loved the world, how much God loved the world that he sacrificed his only son. That is the meaning of the cross. The meaning of the cross is love for God and love for men. And the gospel will begin, if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself and follow me. So right from the beginning, we see the free will that God has given to his creation. Enslavement, people forcing themselves on us, it's against God's will. Man was created free. Yes, Rush was right. <laughs> Freedom is a God-given gift. <laughs> It's a God-given trait. I agree with him in that area. Okay? We are created free. Here, our God tells us, if anyone wishes to come after me, if you want to. If you don't want to, it's up to you. You'll face the consequences, but you're still free to choose. So freedom of will. We must want to. If we don't want to, God cannot save us. St. Augustine says, the one who created you without your will, how could God ask the Adam, hey, do you want me to create you? <laughs> Some of the kids today who rebel, uh, and I've heard this from a number of parents. Some of their kids, especially in Greece, why did you give me birth? Since you gave me birth, now you have to give me money. <laughs> can you imagine that? That's very... Uh, the epitome of rudeness. Huh? God created us because he wanted to extend his love to his creation. Not only he created us, but he gave us his image. He gave us his image and the potential to become like him. He gave us his image and the potential to become godlike. So if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself. And that's not easy, right? Anna? To deny ourselves, to deny our bad habits. Some of these bad habits make us feel good. You know, someone who rules with anger, you know, like a very controlling person, he gets everybody in the office to, because he's, he's a terrorist. And that, that gives him a high because he can terrorize people. Do it my way. It's not easy to give that up. But that's not of God. God wants us to give up what is not God in us. And these passions are not God. They are distorted powers of the soul that went astray. So as I said in the beginning, Adam had all his, all his energies united and they served his devotion to God. Talk to God face to face and he had all the fruits of the Holy Spirit. After the fall, when the grace of God left Adam, now all these energies turned to selfishness. These energies became self-centered, philophthia. And now man wants to use his fellow men for his well-being, for his gain. He'll use greed and destroy people's lives. But he doesn't care about people, the greedy person could care less because someone who serves these passions and idolizes these passions have zero love for God or anybody else. An egotist cannot love another person. An egotist cannot love. He's full of himself. So Christ says, if you want to come after me, you need to make some adjustments. You need to deny your ugly self, your bad self, these bad passions that make you a menace to humanity. And what are these passions? St. Cassian the Roman speaks about eight groups of passions. He calls them the eight vices. This is in Philokalia. And the first one is, very good guess. What is the first passion? Anna. Gluttony. Gluttony. Oh, gluttony. The first one is gluttony. Remember in the desert, the devil tempted Christ with that first yes. temptation. Oh, yes. Yes. Tell these stones to become bread. Yes. Please yourself. But then if Christ would do that. He would be, he'd be doing the will of the devil. And he says, man does not live with bread alone. So we have the first vice is gluttony, not just to eat a lot of food, but to also have delectable, special foods, to, to drive 100 miles to a special restaurant. And sometimes when you're at a wedding, you know, now 
you got a portion of let's say prime rib and uh, whatever another a fish and that's enough for you but the minute the person next to you gets a much gets a much bigger <laughs> <laughs> A, a, much, a much bigger piece. Yeah. You say, why? Why isn't mine that big? Right. <laughs> but because, you know, these passions are really yeah. ingrained in us. So the next one after gluttony is, oh, I like this term. Listen to this. Unchastity. A good way of saying fornication. Oh, 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 okay. <laughs> Unchastity. One of the books translates it like that. Gluttony, fornication. After that, greed. And, and if we serve these passions, we don't get any joy because, you know, they're sinful passions. Then we feel depressed at times when we come home from gatherings, when we go to gatherings, we talked a lot and uh, ate a lot, we drank a lot. Then the next day we feel terrible. And that's where dejection comes in. Dejection is like slight depression. And I'm talking about sadness, just feeling down for some reason. What is the Greek word for that? Leapy. Several types of leapy or sadness. You have spiritual sadness, karma leapy, because I have sadness because I sinned and I offended Christ. I, I denied Christ in, with my actions. I feel sad. That kind of sadness leads to repentance. That's very healthy. But then you have the other kind of sadness, which is of the world. Uh-oh, I just lost half of my money in a stock market and all of a sudden doom and gloom and uh, because your, your, your good life was dependent on that money now you feel depressed or because somebody did not recognize you because somebody they, they did not speak to you kindly you become upset and sad a lot of a lot of our saints when somebody would really curse them out they looked at it as a as a uh, great victory for that day <laughs> you know somebody went to a to an elder and they really began to just uh, you know they they gave him every kind of kind of adjective uh, how awful he was and at the end he says is that all you should really know what i think about it. that was mild you should really know what I think about myself. It's much worse. <laughs> because they have aftomepsia. They constantly accuse themselves for the distance that they have. See, the saints, they don't compare themselves to someone in jail. They compare themselves with Christ. And they see how much of a distance, how distance, how distant they are from God. They constantly weep. So greed, dejection, anger, which is really a child of pride. If we get angry a lot, then pride is the mother of anger. Sloth, spiritual laziness. Not feeling like praying, not feeling like reading the scriptures. You know, having a certain laziness about doing things that will purify our heart, recommended by our church. We'll do all kinds of things all day long, and then when time comes to pray, then we are simply not interested. It's called akidia in Greek, carelessness about spiritual things. And I hate to say it, but 99% of us suffer from this illness. Sophroni of Essex said, St. Sophroni now, that is the illness of our century. Television has helped a lot. All these images, all these things, that all this information, all this spam that we receive all day, we become overly wound. What is the yeah. word? What is the word? And you said the word in Greek, but what's the word in English when people are apathy? Apathy. Apathetic. apathetic. Yeah, apathetic. Okay. Yes. Uh, to be apathetic. I don't care. Yeah. You know, to, to not word. care. Yeah. And, and that actually you know that attacks even monk one time was one monk who could do nothing 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 he couldn't read couldn't pray nothing he just and he sat on a wall and he was swinging his feet back and forth yeah. like a child and they asked him elder what are you doing i am moving my feet for the glory of god it's the only thing he could do so the last one of these vices is pride and some writers, they divide pride into vainglory, which is the beginning of pride. And then if we don't do the necessary struggle, then eventually vainglory. Uh, wanting a name for ourselves, want people to notice us, then when it becomes pride, then that is a very difficult passion to deal with. So according to St. Gregory Palamas, we don't mortify these passions we transfigure them, we redirect them. And the way we do that 
St. Paisius gives us some examples. There was a monk who was just, he was so curious, he was like the newscaster of Mount Athos. He would somehow find out everything about everybody. He would just find information very easily, ask the right questions. And St. Paisius says, listen, you need to take this ability of yours, this curiosity, this vain curiosity, and redirect it, make it holy curiosity and try to find all the lives of the saints, study about them, and talk about the saints, instead of gossiping. That's what I gave up on that. Gossiping? Yep. It's wonderful. Killing me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You get a laugh from everybody. You know, you like to travel? Yes, be a missionary, like Nietzsche. Travel all over, go. But travel for the right reason. You travel for God. You like to be a builder? Be a great builder. Be a Christian builder. Take that potential, take the technique, and build sound buildings. Earthquake worthy. Hundreds of uh, builders in Turkey, they are being arrested because a lot of these buildings will not build properly. If you bribe a number of officials, when they come for the permits and when they come for inspection, you give them enough money, they'll look elsewhere. And then people pay for that. So again, you take these passions. We're supposed to be proud. God made us proud. I mean, we were the crown of creation. But you give the glory to God, not to yourself. You do not become an idol of yourself. So we redirect these passions. We don't simply become apathetic. This is what Varlam was teaching. He was teaching that we need to modify these energies, these, these passions. We need to just destroy them. So we will reach like a nirvana, total apathy. That's not what orthodoxy is. These energies simply need to be redirected. And we take these actions that we did for the world and we redirect them for the glory of God. Again, you're an educator. You teach properly, Valerie. You avoid the fear of revolution. You, you, tell him, you tell them about Dostoevsky. That's fine. <laughs> because he was orthodox. At least at the end of his life, from what I remember. So how do we deal with these passions that really, you know, make our, our life miserable? Again, if you're living with an arrogant person, I just, you know, there's children today, 12, 13 year olds, that rebel against the parents and they leave their home and come at three in the morning and the parents can do nothing. How do you deal with these passions? It's a new generation. Christ says, come to me, you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Give us rest from what? From our passions. It's our passions, our weaknesses, our stubbornness that destroys our lives, our egotism. Most of the couples in Greece now, you know, there's 60, 70 percent divorces. Their marriage lasts about 90 days to a year. Why? Because they cannot transcend their egotism. I want it my way. And Christ says, come to me and I will give you rest. And although the gospel tomorrow says, if you want to gain your life, you must lose it. What kind of life? The life of the world. You must lose that life of the world. How do you lose it? We're getting to it, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to help you. Thank you. You're so helpful. <laughs> First of all, the way we first, you know, we have to have the diagnosis. Yeah. We have the diagnosis. We know our weaknesses. And now we pray to God and God will lose them for us. We can do nothing without Christ. He will fight our battles. We cannot get rid of our passions. No way. Without his help, no. So we go to him with repentance, with metania. The church fathers say, you give God your will. Tell God that you want to, but you must want to. If you don't want to, forget it. If you are, if you have a problem with substances, you can go to a dozen of rehab centers. You can spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. If that person, if that victim doesn't want to, if that, if doesn't hate that sinful behavior, he will not change. People who recuperated, it was people who hated that lifestyle. And they said, enough is enough. Then you go to God and say, Lord, I want to, but I can't. That's fine. I want to, but I can't. Of course you can't, but God can. So we want to. We go to Christ who says, I am the way, the way. What's the way? Christianity, the truth and the life. I am the way. I gave you the way, the way of the scriptures, the way of the church. So 
if you want to and you get on that way, now you will come face to face with the truth who's Christ. I am the truth. The truth is a person. The name of that person is Christ. I'm the truth and the life, the true life. I came so you can have life, an abundant life. So the life of the world is an injustice. All these years that we surrendered to our passions, we did injustice to ourselves. We wasted all these years with our arrogance and selfishness. So true life is to know who God is, to follow his way, and begin to purify our hearts because when he appears, we will see him as he is. And anyone who has the hope of seeing Christ during the second coming, he must purify himself from these passions because, again, these passions will be a wall between God and our neighbor. We can never love God if we harbor these passions. St. Isaac the Syrian says it very clearly. Don't deceive yourself. Even if you have one passion, you don't love God. Explain. Judas. Judas wanted to be religious. He was a disciple. He loved what Christ was talking about, but his passion was greed and power. That one passion was enough. To kill him. Yeah, to kill him. Because when you have a balloon in the sky, those beautiful balloons, you know, they don't have those. Remember those beautiful balloons that used to, you know, uh, do advertisements? What happened to them? I don't see any. I, I don't see them anymore. The blimp. You're yeah, about the yeah. Blimp. Well, not just the blimp, no. just a lot. The balloons. A lot of balloons. I remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Over there on, uh, <laughs> yeah. where, where the most places at. Yeah. They so, come from there. So when you have a balloon in the sky, okay, you don't need a lot of holes in it. Just one hole, Anna, will bring that balloon down. So what is the cross? The cross in our life. The cross is the way of Christ. The cross is to come to ourselves, just like the prodigal man, the prodigal son, who after his belly was empty and he had hunger pangs, then he came to himself. Before that, he was in a state of fantasy. Away from my father, I'm going to have freedom. I'm going to enjoy myself. I'm going to do things my, I'm going to do things my way. But that was his artificial and false self. So now he came to himself. That means metania, to have a change of a mindset. I made a mess of my life and I, I need to turn to God, to my creator. So now we turn to God and we undertake the struggle. We follow the commandments of God and the tradition of our church. We use the discipline of our church, which is really a hospital for our therapy. That's what the church is. And we combat gluttony with what? With fasting. The antidote to gluttony is fasting. Yes, you love eggs every morning, but not for the next 40 days. And at that point, what you're doing is you're saying no to your bad self and yes to God and his church. You're giving up your own will. This is the biggest factor in fasting. It's not about giving up something, giving up chocolate. Well, I'm going to give up chocolate for Lent. But you're still doing your own will. You decided for yourself. But now the church decides for you. Someone else decides for you. So you are giving up your own will. And you start with fasting. And that means fasting with the eyes, fasting with the ears, fasting with television, and also fasting with anger. You know, when your wife is very tired, Jimmy, when you come home, okay, you don't go, why isn't the food ready? Because she's going to tell you, you know what? Go, go, okay, now, now, now go get us pizza. <laughs> go get us gourmet pizza. Go ahead, if, you know, if, if you're impatient. I mean, we really transcend our selfishness and put the other person first. That's much more important than fasting. When you do the physical fasting, it'll slowly begin to form, to form inside of us the mindset of Christ, mm. of meekness and humility. We do the fasting, we go to church to pray, the mysteries of the church, all these things are bringing inside of us the grace of God. And if we have the grace of God, then we will become more patient, more kind, more loving. It's about bringing the grace of God when we do not our will, but the will of God in the church. Another way to really combat these passions 
a beautiful way is the Jesus prayer. When we pray the Jesus prayer, uh, St. Gregory Palamas used a different format for a few years. Uh, Lord, enlighten my darkness. But we have different forms. And it's all from the Bible. Son of David, have mercy on me. Lord, save me. That was Peter. And he was sinking in the waves. A lot of the paralytics. Son of David, have mercy on me. The same thing with the uh, Syrophoenician woman. She had a demon-possessed daughter. And she ran after Christ. And she continued to run after her, even when he called her a dog. Not, I'm not going to give my breath to the dogs. That's what the Jews were calling the non-Jews, dogs. And he did this you know, to, to really show to his disciples that outside of Israel, there were great souls. And this woman was amazing. She was so quick and so gifted that she took that insult, turned it around, and made herself victorious in front of Christ. Lord, even the dogs need some crumbs. Just give me a crumb. Because I've never seen such faith and such humility. Humility is the answer humility, that one. More humility. Than faith. But she didn't give up, you see. Mm -hmm. Humility. Because... Her pain was so much. She spent all her money. She went to all the sorcerers, to everybody, and she knew this was her only opportunity, her only hope, and that pain brought humility. You hit the nail on the head because deep humility does not come with reading books or being polite. Deep humility, unfortunately, comes from pain, from pain. So the Jesus prayer, once we begin to pray the Jesus prayer, let's say that I had some friction with George. Uh -oh. I had some friction with George, and I don't feel good about George. Now, now what do you strangely do? enough, if you begin to pray the Jesus prayer, and you pray for George and everybody else, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on your servant, Yorion, Dimitrion, Eleni. When you do that, the grace of God comes and it unites you not only with George, but it unites you with the whole world. If you continue that prayer for 10, 15 minutes every morning and you do it with a program, then eventually you'll find out that you have no enemies. It brings the compassion of Christ in your heart and then those ice cubes that we feel for some people, they are dissolved. It breaks down all the walls, even if we despise or dislike people. This is the first fruit of the Jesus prayer, the sense of unity, that we are all children of Adam. And again, it's a very simple prayer that St. Gregory did for many, many years. And at some point when he was saying, Lord, illumine my darkness, St. John the Apostle appears. Why are you yelling out for years now, illumine my darkness? The Panagia asked me to ask you this question. What else can I do being a very sinful person full of passions? It's the only thing I can ask for. You're <laughs> saying Gregory. He was holy from the time he was young. He was practicing the Jesus prayer all his life. His father was a saint. He was brilliant. He became a monk at the age of 19. And he has darkness. Why is it that we don't see our darkness? He saw darkness. Why don't we? Because we are stiff-necked and we have callousness in our hearts. But he knew about that third light. You see, there's three lights according, according to St. Gregor Palamas. You have sunlight, which is natural. You have the light of the mind, who's going to study and get a PhD. And uh, he's enlightened intellectually. That's called enlightenment, like the enlightenment of Europe. It was intellectual enlightenment. This kind of light is natural, created. But St. Gregory knew that there was another light that could burn his passions, another light that would bring Christ in his heart, unceasingly, the uncreated light. And that's what he gained. He was, he had been studying St. Simeon, the new theologian. Yes, of course, years, of course. St. Simeon also did the same thing. And uh, I will send you a uh, recording that I did in uh, Chicago about how, how much trouble he had in the last 23 years of his life. St. Gregory. Hmm. He was apprehended by Muslims, by Turks, pirates. They took his boat captive and they were asking for a ransom for a whole year. He was going through Asia Minor, having discussions and dialogues hmm. with Muslims. And his answers were formidable. He did not compromise. 
Do you love our Prophet Muhammad? No, I don't love your Prophet Muhammad because he's not a prophet. He's nowhere to be seen in the Old Testament. Look, St. John the Baptist is in the, in the Old Testament. The Panagia is in the Old Testament. Christ is all over the New Testament. Where is your Muhammad? He's no different than the book on Ezra and Alexander and some of the other emperors and uh, world leaders. He simply spread his religion by the sword. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Was just to get off that, just because you brought up Muhammad, was he a person? Muhammad? Yeah. He's I thought the... maybe he was like an imaginary... Oh, no, no, no. He was a real person. Oh. He was from uh, Medina, I believe, Saudi Arabia, and he was employed by, uh, I believe, a, a very wealthy Jewish family, and uh, he spent a lot of time in Jerusalem. So he learned the Old Testament very well from the Jews, and also the New Testament from a Nestorian monk. The so he combined I, things. Yeah, the reason why I got to thinking that is because I don't think Buddha was ever... Okay. He was a real person. Oh, was he? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. As a matter <laughs> of fact, are... yeah, Buddha was a real Not person. <laughs> okay, let me just... Uh, so again, Great Lent is a great gift for us from the church to begin to learn about these things and apply them. And not only for ourselves, but to be able to give a word to those in the world, to give them hope, give hope to other people. Because once a Christian, you're automatically an apostle. Oh no, they're very wonderful people. I mean, I lived with some of them in college and uh, with some uh, people from Iran. Now, they're polite, they are... I was trying to convert a Sabrine when I went to Lebanon, I met this, you know, this uh, uh, girl from Kuwait, very virtuous, uh, searching. She was a teacher. And I, I began to email her about Christ, about the Trinity. And uh, I was making progress. And then she says, I'm sorry, they just, they just married me off and I will never be able to speak to you again. <laughs> I said, okay, they are in danger. I mean, if you, mm -hmm. you find out that you're having Christian communications... Yeah, so I said, yeah, please don't write to me ever again. <laughs> no. God help you. Yeah, I'm gonna find you anywhere. <laughs> okay, very good. I don't think we are going to have a talk in uh, in April. The only possibility might be Lazarus Saturday, and I think that's too busy. You guys have yeah. to be in church. and you. So uh, we will continue again after Pascha at some point.